Welcome to Aspects of Writing with your host, James Kelly. Now, let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello, and welcome to Aspects of Writing. James Kelly is off today. My name is Cynthia DeBoer, and I'm with my co-host today, which is Miss Temple Kenyon. Hi, Temp. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? I'm good. Good. It's fun to be here. When James is away, we get to play in his studio for Aspects of Writing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So we are actually gathered here today to talk about something very near and dear to our hearts, One Million Books in 100 Days. And it's a wonderful program that we work with James Kelly, who's the mastermind behind it, and through Quirky Minds Media and All Aspects Radio. It is a program where we sell books, self-published by those authors out there, and and for every book sold, a dollar goes to charity. And hopefully then our royalty level that we pay back to the self-published author is a little higher than maybe some other platforms that they go through to sell their books. So we're selling books and we're helping charity and it's 1 million books in 100 days. Yes. And all anyone has to do is go to 1 million books in 100 days.com and you can join this campaign and know that not only are you helping us starving authors, but you're <laughs> also helping some starving people because we do support Three Square, which is really an awesome charity. And it's a marvelous, marvelous program. And Temple and I are also involved, which is really neat. So we're here to talk about that and share a little bit about some of our authors and our multi-genres. Yes. And we have one of our awesome authors, like you said, Cynthia, with us here today, Sarah Tosh. Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us again. And first of all, before I dive into the one million books thing, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background as a writer? Sure. I actually started in writing as a playwright and wrote uh, short plays, one act plays all through high school and college. And after I graduated college, I moved on to short stories and then into web series um, and short web videos, won a couple of awards through some contests I entered. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. Um, and then lately I've been working in novellas which is the book that I've contributed to uh, this effort here. That's right. We've got Dead Mall, The January Hours by Sarah Tosh. And I'm going to spell the last name. It's T-A-S-Z. Mm -hmm. That's Sarah Tosh. Yes. And I am so excited about this book because it's a heavy one. It's nice and full of lots of good stuff. I can tell there's some heft to it. It's my summer reading because, you know, awesome. you can always take it to the beach or whatever you're doing on vacation, riding in a car or whatever. And you got this great, nice book full of stuff. So um, before we dive in, do you want to tell us about the stories in the novellas in Dead Mall? Sure. Um, so there are five novellas in the January Hours collection. There are four main books in the continuing series and then one prequel that mentions how the state of things came to be. And the story itself, I guess you'd call the genre comedy horror or maybe a supernatural thriller kind of thing. And it centers on a 16 year old girl who one day discovers that the mall in her town, which is half empty and sort mm -hmm. of full of weird stores that, you know, that aren't empty abandoned storefronts. She discovers that it is basically full of monsters at night. Um, <laughs> Love this storyline. <laughs> uh, at night, the gates of hell open up and let out different kinds of demons and creatures and things. And the only thing that stops them from escaping and wreaking havoc on the town and the world is a group of custodians and janitors that work there that have learned to fight them over the years. So Carrie, which is the name of the main character, she joins them and the series is all about their adventures in the mall. I'm uh, dating myself, I guess, but as kids, we ran around in the mall all the time. That was the yeah. place to go was the mall. So I am very interested in this story. <laughs> exactly. And when we talk about novellas and you got involved in that and then you did your book through indie publishing and we had kind of talked a little bit pre-interview about novellas and the indie world. Can you explain your feelings on those? Yeah. So before I started this project, I had been working on a novel, a regular full-length novel that I was pursuing traditional publishing on and it was my first one and like so many first novels I didn't feel like it was going anywhere. I was getting the same kind of comments that a lot of people get when they submit their query letters. A lot of it was actually no response at all. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. And yeah. the rest of it was very, you know, not specific, just not for me or whatever and I was getting very frustrated and I wanted something that was a little bit more I guess not really instant gratification but I, I felt like I had a little bit more control over it. Mm -hmm. And novella I settled on that because it's not something that you can really pursue through 
traditional publishing. It's just there's no real advice, honestly, on querying novellas. Mm -hmm. I don't really know any traditional publishers that, that publish them and certainly not in series. So I decided if I'm going to go the self-publishing route, I want to do something that is sort of tailored to that industry. So that's why I chose that. And the topic itself, I had written fan fiction several years prior to publishing it, sort of Evil Dead, Army of Darkness fan fiction revolving around the S-Smart idea, if anyone knows what that is in the Evil Dead series. And I'd really enjoyed writing it. I had a bunch of original characters, original plot lines. So I took that and kind of brushed aside the intellectual property that didn't belong to me <laughs> and created this instead. Wow, that is quite a journey. And I like that you're on Aspects of Writing talking about this because it shows a lot of people will read this book, but it's a real specific path that you chose based off of your knowledge of the industry and what you wanted to do versus what maybe the industry was wanting people to do. So you've created your own publishing path and that is very interesting and very helpful to our listeners, I believe. I do too yeah. because I think that a lot of times indie authors are kind of just like, yeah, well, you know, it's great, but it's not the real deal. But when you talk about a novella and that basically indie is the way to go, I mean, that just kind of elevates it in my mind too. Yeah, and you're passionate about it. We can tell. So yeah, that's probably absolutely. why it's so successful to this point is that you're excited about it. So why did you decide to join One Million Books in 100 Days? Well, the primary reason was the charity aspect, the fact that one dollar of every book sold goes to help Three Square Food Bank. I'm a big admirer of Three Square. I have been ever since I started attending their restaurant week several years mm -hmm. back. Yep. That's where I learned about them. And then, of course, this year they've been instrumental in helping the Las Vegas community. And in that vein, I had been trying to do a portion of my sales would go to them, but didn't really have the platform for it. So when I found out about this, I was like, this is great. It's a built-in charitable platform that I can use to sell my books. Yeah, we were really happy to have you too because James Kelly, he's really particular about the authors that are on here in the fact that we didn't want 50 books on one specific genre. Right. And you definitely filled a niche for us. So that was really wonderful to be able to do that because we are about diversity and we are about really having something for every reader to pick up and hold because we don't do eBooks, we don't do audio. This is something that you can pick up and smell and flip through the pages and like. Like Temple said, take to the beach and fall in love yeah. with. So it's yeah. it's a really cool thing to be able to do that. We are in our third campaign. And for everyone out there, it's not just for this 100 days. You guys can go to this website year round. The good thing about each campaign is that every author has the opportunity to add a new book. And we do add new authors every time, which is really a fantastic thing. Yeah, we're excited mm -hmm. to have you as part of the family. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so hopefully. Cool. Hopefully, there's going to be more books. You want to share a little teaser for people who read this book, Dead Mall, the January Hours, when they get done with it, they're going to want more. So what are you working on now? Absolutely. So like I said, there are four books in sequence in the January Hours collection. And the fifth book will be coming out early September. It's all drafted. It just has to go through its paces with editing. Look for that one soon. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is that when you talk about beach reading, this is like a big, heavy book, mm -hmm. but because it's split into five smaller books you can really like get through a whole story in one setting now, so it's actually great for beach reading you're or speaking my vacation language. <laughs> yes <laughs> yes because we know vacation you can get diverted on other exciting things but yep. i always like to have a good book to take with me so see it's perfect yes <laughs> you know definitely. your interest in three square and you being an indie author and filling a niche that we needed i mean it was just all the planets aligned to have you be part of the one million books family yeah, I'm really glad I could get in there right at the deadline, as I recall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what deadline? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share a little bit of maybe where people can find you out on the internet or other ways that you like to communicate with your fans? Right, absolutely. The best way to get a hold of me and to learn about what's coming up next is through my publishing company, which is the Ugly Cat Press. I have a Facebook page. I have a Medium page. I have a Twitter account, Instagram, and a YouTube account where I actually do some book reviews for specifically independent books, either self-published or through small presses, and starting up an author interview series 
talking to Las Vegas and Nevada writers about what they write and why they choose to write here of all places. That's great. What a wonderful thing to do for other writers. Maybe I'll catch you later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a ton of fun. We have you know, a full hour to talk about the bibliography and the history and nice. the author's relationship with Nevada and Las Vegas specifically because I really do think it's a fantastic place to write. My book is set here. I moved here for the writer community specifically. Wow, that's and, great. Yeah, and I can't say enough about it. It's been so valuable, again, especially last year, even though I couldn't meet yep. with people in person. It was invaluable to have that, knowing that that support was still there. Yeah, Vegas does have a wonderful writing community. We have a lot of Vegas authors, uh, part of One Million Books in 100 Days, and the people who aren't here locally that are participating are part of our family. They're like the family that lives across the country and comes home for Christmas and Thanksgiving, kind of, <laughs> you know? But they're all part of our family. But we do have a great backbone for authors here in Vegas. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's something that we had talked about before, that it's really important for people in other states to realize that we're not just the 24-hour gambling mm-hmm. town. No. Mm-hmm. We have so many passionate people. We have schools, and we have children, and we have <laughs> shopping, and we have... You know, Malls so, with yes. demons. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. That's mostly northern Nevada. Yes. <laughs> We love you, Northern Nevada. <laughs> I only say that because my book is set in Northern Nevada. I love so. that. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. So see, even Northern Nevada is recognized in see? our, our yes. area. <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us here on Aspects of Writing to talk about our goals with your little book in life, but as part of One Million Books in 100 Days. We really appreciate your participation in it. And I guess we're on to our next guest. Yes, we are. Thank you again, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Welcome back to Aspects of Writing. I'm Temple Kenyon, and this is Cynthia DeBoer. We're sitting in for James Kelly today, and we're talking about a very wonderful program, One Million Books in 100 Days. Yes, it's great. And we are actually in the third campaign. And what that means is that we do two campaigns a year, but our website is up year round, which is phenomenal. And it's a great program. The authors are all indie authors. The majority of them do come from the Las Vegas area, but we have our family extended throughout the country and uh, multiple genres. So it's wonderful, wonderful program. And today... We have one of our multi-genre gentlemen with us, and his name is Joe Cortez. Joe, thanks for joining us, and would thanks, you give Joe. us just a little bit of background about you as a writer? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Yes. Well, most of my life I've been a teacher, and I usually was assigned students that didn't like to study the English language. So it was quite a challenge, especially when you have to teach Shakespeare to a group of students that are technically oriented or that like to work on engines or to become a chef, that kind of thing. So I learned early on in my teaching career that you have to change your style of teaching, your pedagogy, and you need to adapt it to the needs of the students. So I learned to explain things very thoroughly until I could see everyone in the class shaking their head they understood Mm -hmm. before I move on to another topic. So So I would say about in my 50s, I won't tell you my real age right now, but in my (laughs) 50s, Mm -hmm. I learned I had a talent also to write clearly. So I started to write. And a lot of that came from doing my doctoral dissertation and following all the rules of writing and making it plain and understandable. So I'm proud to say that not only can I teach to anyone's level and make them understand clearly, but I also can write very clearly. When I learned I had that skill, that talent, and I had students from different countries I was teaching, and they would say, oh my gosh, I understand exactly what you're telling us. I thought, wow. So some of my students actually said, why don't you write a book? So I did. And then, of course, once you write one, you feel, oh, maybe there's another one in me. So I've written two, and I'm proud to have them as part of the program here. And I'm on my third right now. I started my third. Good. Congrats. Uh, little preview. It's called After I Die, Then What? Ooh. So I've studied near-death mm-hmm. experiences and uh-huh. mediums, and I've seen quite a few. And I've studied all the research that's out there, and I'm trying to put all the scientific research from medical personnel, etc., that have witnessed these. Nice. Nice. In addition to people who have experienced them into plain language. And How it's really fascinating. fascinating. That's so <laughs> I'm about halfway yeah. through. So it's really going to be so neat, but I'm excited. We're going to be I have excited. I info for you on yeah. that as well. Thank you. Because yeah. I do know of a anesthesiologist.
psychologist down in Tucson <sighs> that has experienced that. And there's also mm -hmm. a certain marker on an EEG that will show that. Right. So that's medical. It's really interesting. And we all seem to have the same experience. That's what's really interesting, regardless of your religion, your culture, your background, or exactly. your age. Wow. Oh, so yeah. I want to read that book now. Mm -hmm. So hurry up okay, and get I will. that done. <laughs> I will. And we'll add it to One Million Books in 100 Days. <laughs> no problem. So why don't you tell us about <laughs> the books that you do have with One Million Books in 100 okay. Days? Like what genre are they? Mm -hmm. A little bit about each one of them? Any yeah, insight you sure. have to share? I have two books. One is called Phoenixivity, and that one is kind of like an autobiography. However, once I started writing about my life and where it has led me, I went down a couple of different paths, and I started doing research about the phoenix because I've been in a position where life deals you sometimes a lot of blows yeah. and a lot of curveballs and you know I suffered a really nasty divorce and a bankruptcy and at the time I was finishing my doctorate and I was in a really highly responsible position in education and it seemed like my whole world came crashing down at one point and I went into Barnes and Noble and some other libraries and I started to notice that there aren't too many books that help males go through a crisis such as I was encountering. Interesting. So mm -hmm. I read all the books written by females, and I thought, well, this should also apply to males. Males have feelings. Hello. Not that I cry <laughs> every day, but, you know, our yeah. culture has told us we're machismo, we're supposed to be males, and our ego prevents us from showing our feelings. And I thought, no, no, no. So that's what the book is about. So it's a self-help book. It's geared for anyone, regardless of sex or your status in life, and also to help people that are in depression and deep anxiety. Okay. My second book just happened over the pandemic last year because I had a lot of extra time being cooped up indoors. <laughs> And I had all these books about education. I thought, I've been in education all my life. Why don't I express how I feel about it and how we can make it better without using money? So I started reading things, and I started looking at notes from conventions and conferences and things I had studied in my doctorate. And I thought, I'm going to put this into plain English yeah. and tell people what's really wrong with our schools, our public schools, and how we can change them. So the second book is very educational, but it's geared for parents, mm -hmm. for school board members, for educators. And rather than try and change things, let's use what worked in the past and update it. Okay. So that's the course of that book. That's perfect. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And for our viewers, we have both books sitting here in our studio. Beautiful covers, great artwork on there. So Thank you. very enticing. Very much so. Yes. So I want to read both of them. And they're very easy reads. And the first because one. Because you clarify correct. it so well. You are correct. such a exactly. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the whole point exactly. of it. Exactly. <laughs> So because the first we're all one, busy. Yeah, the anyway. first one is titled Phoenixivity, mm -hmm. and the next one is The Missing Link in Education, which right. we did not announce the title right. of that one. But yeah, and mm -hmm. I love it because you're not coming from a, we got to throw a million dollars at this to fix it. No. And that was a really great thing. Mm -hmm. So I know through our association, you were invited to be a part of One Million Books in 100 Days. But what really made you decide that this is something you wanted to be involved in? Well, self-published authors have a rough time getting out there. You yeah. don't make the New York Times bestseller list. It's hard to market your product. It's hard to tell people about what's inside of you that you want to communicate with them, share with them. So it was a great opportunity since I moved here from California a few years ago. I didn't really have the exposure and the contacts here that I would like to have. Mm -hmm. And this was a great opportunity for myself and a lot of other writers from the local area to tell people what we're all about. And our books are meant to help others. They're not meant meant to be bestsellers and make a million dollars or anything like that. We have the drive as self-published authors, and that's all part of the program here, to express ourselves and to help others. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, too, people don't understand that if you are, quote-unquote, an indie or a self-published author, that the production of this and everything along the way, whether we pay someone to help us or not, mm -hmm. this is money out of pocket. So every person that's involved in this is very passionate, mm -hmm. very committed. And the golden thing that I think about this, not only do we get bigger royalty than with a lot of distribution outlets, right. but we also have the ability to help charity. And right. $1 from every book, whether it's in our push, which is our two campaigns a year, mm -hmm 
or not, if it's sold on 150 days, a dollar of that book still goes to charity. And I think that that is a biggie for Mm -hmm. us. Yes, it is. And like I said a few minutes ago, it's to help people. And the fact that part of the money from selling the book goes to help a charity is phenomenal. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you find out about One Million Books? Just out of curiosity. You know, I'm throwing this one at you out of left field, but how did you find out about it? I found out about it through Ninon. Oh, we love Love Ninon. Yep. Quirky Vegas Mice Live. Media loves Ninon. And her associate, Lynn. <laughs> okay. They're yes. friends of mine. Oh, they are. And okay. once they heard that I wrote a couple of books... They said, oh, well, why don't you come to the studio? There you go. <laughs> See, folks? See? Yep. Who you Networking. know. Networking, yes. yes. Yeah, well, that's cool. Well, yeah. we appreciate you being part of it and being so passionate and excited. We love adding new authors. And mm. so Joe joined us during this campaign, right? This yes. is your first campaign. So we hope we keep you. It won't be the last. From now on. Yay! Right. Because <laughs> I really want that third book, Oh, too. yes, <laughs> definitely. Me, too. Yeah. So all you got to do, as we've said before, go out to One Million Books in 100 mm-hmm. Days. Dot com and you can look up his books by title or his name or mm-hmm. genre and you'll find that you have a little bit of summary about what the book's about and you put your some right there it's just all so easy so we hope that this is a successful campaign for you too joe and Thank we you. really appreciate you being on aspects of writing and being a part of our quirky minds media family thanks for having me yeah definitely all right we will be back with our next guest on aspects of writing thank you so much Welcome back to Aspects of Writing. I'm Temple Kenyon. And again, I'm with Cynthia DeBoer. We're sitting in for James Kelly today talking about one of our wonderful programs, One Million Books in 100 Days. That's right, Temple. One of the amazing One Million Books authors is going to be joining us today via Zoom. And we are going to welcome Susan Johnson. And to give you a little bit of an idea, this is the third campaign of One Million Books in 100 Days, although the website is up year-round, and it is a phenomenal program for indie authors. We're going to talk to our lovely Susan and find out a little bit about her background as a writer. Hi, Susie. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me on the show this morning. I'm really, really honored and excited to be here with you today. Thank you. So I was not one of those people, do you hear about the authors, kind of like Temple, they grow up and they dream of being an author. Oh, yes, I write, you know, and I've taken the English classes, I've done all these things. Uh, me, eh, no. <laughs> I want to be a writer growing up, never even crossed my mind. I graduated college just a few years ago, back in 1999. Uh-huh. Yeah. Couple. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I was so burnt out. I had bipolar disorder and going through college was so difficult living with bipolar disorder. About. After five years and four and a half colleges, I graduated with my BA in sociology. And I was like, I'm done. I'm never writing again. So then I went into my dream jobs of working in elementary schools with special education students. And again, the thought never crossed my mind, right? I got married almost 14 years ago. And at that point, I began having flashbacks and like PTSD almost of the past. And I just couldn't get through it. Mm -hmm. So I began to write. I began to write my story, but I didn't know how to go about to do it. So I found a how to write a memoir workshop and I heard a great speaker and I went home and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's, <laughs> let's write the memoir. Yeah. And then came the writing. Yeah. Yeah. That blank screen staring back at you. That hard part and finding the time to do it. So yeah. I found a class, how to write a memoir class taught by an 80 year old man and he gave me the encouragement Bob Polly to say you know what you have talent as a writer you can do this I believe in you and that was the encouragement that I got and I also got a lot of encouragement from his wife Renee they kept after me for years it took six years of stopping and starting and reliving the past. I remember sitting in my doctor's office and he's like, Susie, this is making me sick. You have to stop writing. Oh, geez. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, but I can't. Yeah, you were I committed. Started, yeah, I started it. So I walked away from it for 
you know, maybe six months, but I knew I had to go back. Yeah. And after I had completed it, I hadn't even thought about sharing it with anyone. I mean, these were my private tell all stories. Yeah. I didn't want to expose myself. I didn't want my parents to read it. I didn't want the world to read it, but I knew I had an important message to share with the world of hope. And I wanted to break the space. Wow. That takes a lot of courage. Yeah, to, you should. to open yourself up like that and not to make a pun, but to literally be an open book, that takes a lot of courage. It's not only that, but it's putting your own feelings and your own self aside to help other people. I mean, that's to be applauded. You know, we hope that everybody is like that. But when you're sharing such a story, I mean, my God, that's just phenomenal. You are an angel on this planet. That's all I have to say. Yeah, you've so, helped a lot of people. Know that far, but thank you. That's I'm great. serious. I'm serious because it's a lot. It truly and is. And you know, when you put your memoir out there, Cynthia, I know you can relate in writing your book. You know, you have to also deal with those people that are critiquing you. And yeah. You, yeah. you know how hard that is. Yeah. You know, this is my story. And, you know, read the Amazon reviews. Not everybody. Well, thank goodness I have a lot of good reviews, but not everybody loves it. And you Which know, is hard. And that is funny because it's your life. So you're like, well, if you don't like my life, then that's too bad. No, I guess we can't go to lunch. <laughs> right. I can't redo it. So why don't you go ahead and just share with us the book, Some Dreams Are Worth Keeping. And it's a memoir of my bipolar journey by Susan Johnson. And we have it here in our studio as well for our viewers that can see it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the actual book that is at One Million Books in 100 Days? So I pretty much started the book on a manic episode. And if you don't know what bipolar disorder is, chemical imbalance in the brain, which causes euphoric highs known as manias and devastating lows to the point of suicide. So I started the book on my first mania. I was on a cruise ship and I described the events of just me out of control. So I started that as kind of the hook. And then I went back in time and the book is chronological, starting with my childhood and then just going through my journey, especially the obstacles that I had to overcome in college. Yeah. I used some doctor records and that was very, very helpful when writing the book. My psychologist that helped me, she was my angel, Dr. Catherine Evans. She shared my doctor records and they were about this thick and I got them copied and she sent them to me. So that helped me jog the memory because there's no way that I was going to remember, especially those dark days. Yeah, yeah. So the book goes on and I also used my personal journal. So I found that yeah. very, very helpful. And I mean, that shows the manias, that shows the depressions. Um, that's the very raw story that I've lived through. It just continues to go on. Um, I hit rock bottom and I rebuilt my life in Las Vegas. And I think that's really important too, because a lot of people, even when they look at any kind of self-help book that is based on a memoir, they always want the ending. You know, everybody wants the happy ending. Everybody wants the positive thing. And you not only give the positive thing, but you give the steps to get to the positive ending. And I think that that's really important for people to understand when they read your book, that this isn't doom and gloom. This is, hey, this is what happened, but we can be happy. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah. I love the journal excerpt, especially. Mm -hmm. Of course, the whole story, when I say I love it, I know that it was a really hard journey because it's your life, but it's written in a way that it does hook you and it does pull you in. And you read these excerpts from Susan's journal and you are in her head mm -hmm. and it's really kind of weird. It's like, and I'm seeing and feeling what you must have, obviously, when you wrote those journal entries and it kind of really slammed at home for me. So it's very well written to express those highs and lows and what you did after and how you got through it and who you reached out to. And then the end does give that hope mm -hmm. and you kept your dreams and you pursued your dreams. And I just like the journal entries. They're very telling, very telling. Yeah. And they get you right in the gut. I mean, if, if you walk away after reading one of those and, and you don't have an emotional tie to that book, 
you better be checking what's going on with you. Read because. it again. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite Amazon reviews was from just a random person living with bipolar disorder. And she said, thank you for writing this. This is our life. This is yes. our journey living with bipolar disorder. Because so many people don't get it. Right. And your book is definitely for people who have it, but it's for people who don't suffer from it or don't have it as a part of their lives because personal friends or loved ones has it. So that's where I read it is that I don't have anyone other than you that's close to me that has bipolar. And so it was a very educational book, but it's also for those people who do suffer from bipolar. Yeah. So that's everyone. Yeah. And it's also helping a lot of families. I was surprised. Yes. I didn't even think about that yeah you know, I've gotten a lot of thank yous from particular family members and that means so much well but, and that way other people can understand she's just being her today no there's a reason that she's in a bad mood or maybe there's a reason that she's acting crazy and you don't want to take her shopping today or whatever because she's going to go flying off the wall and I think that's really important because if we don't understand we can't help and we can't have compassion and that's what we need. And yeah. I think that that's really, really important. Yeah. So what drew you to be a part of 1 Million Books in 100 Days and have it out on our website and be one of those showcased authors? What drew you to the 1 Million Books? Being able to use my work to bless others. But I love the charity that was chosen, Three Square. Have you guys gotten a chance to go to Three Square? Years ago, I did. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it is phenomenal. I got to volunteer there and help bag some of the food. And I've seen what a difference Three Square makes in the city of Las Vegas. And for me to be any part of that is just such an honor. I work in a school. I've seen it help my students. I've seen it help in my church. With the pandemic, it's just such a blessing to so many people. So for me to be able to be a part of that. And it is very special. And I think that that's what you know, listening audience needs to understand that, yes, we are indie authors and obviously passionate about what we do. And you're a very good example of that. But not only that, a dollar from every book that someone buys goes to charity. And on top of that, yes, we are in our third campaign, which lasts 100 days. And those are the twice a year pushes for this. But the website is up year round. So even if somebody buys a book on day 150 or 160, still a dollar goes to charity. And I really feel very good about it. Temple and I are both authors on it as well. And we just love it for that aspect. Really, again, multi-genre. And you're amazing for what you've done. And it's just been really great to hear your story. Because I don't really think that a lot of people understand that a, an indie or self-published author you know what? It's not just the blood, sweat, and tears of getting the thing written, but it's all the work after. Yeah. We that's really appreciate. Whole, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> that's a whole different interview about the blood, sweat, and tears. Though. Oh, well, <laughs> right. we'll have, have you back. So we just want to thank you for being a part of our 1 million books in 100 days family. And we wish you success. So any of our listeners, please go out to 1 million books in 100 days.com. Look up Susan Johnson. Some dreams are worth keeping a memoir of my bipolar journey and buy as many copies as you can possibly purchase. Give them out to all your friends and family. They are blessings snuggled in between a beautiful cover. So we just want to thank you so much for being part of the show today, Susan. Thank you so much for having me. It's thank you. Have a blessed day. All right. We'll be right back with our next guest on Aspects of Writing. Thank you. Welcome back to Aspects of Writing. I'm Temple Kenyon, and this is Cynthia DeBoer with me today. We're sitting in for James Kelly, and we're talking about 1 Million Books in 100 Days. That's right. And 1 Million Books in 100 Days, we are actually in our third campaign, which obviously lasts for the 100 days. We do a, <laughs> a spring and a fall one, and our website is up year-round. And we have multi-genre authors. We're indie authors. And we have one of the amazing authors with us today. This woman never stops. We want to welcome Miss Morgan St. James. And Morgan, would you please give us a little bit of your background as far as your writing? Have you got a couple of days? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> we have to narrow exactly. it down a little. Yeah, just, well, a, just a touch. <laughs> I really didn't start out to be a writer, and I've had no college courses on writing, although I have attended many workshops given by working writers. Mm -hmm. And 
And I've had many careers, and those careers have really helped me in my writing because I know a little bit about a lot of things. Oh, cool. And I call myself the accidental writer because, Mm. as I said, I never started out to be a writer. I was an interior designer at the time, and my firm was approached about doing an article for a very prestigious design magazine about a project my partner and I had done. And she said, no, between the design business and being an actress, I just don't have the time. And I said, I'll do it. And so it wound up with the two of us doing it. And as I said, we weren't writers. All of a sudden, the deadline was approaching. The photographers had been out and we didn't have a darn thing to give them. So we sat around my house the night before it was due, (laughs) drinking wine, commiserating. (laughs) And finally, we said, oh, the heck with it. We've got to turn something in. Let's do it like a, I don't know, like a noir mystery. Mm -hmm. So we did a thing. It was about a very elegant floor made from packing crates. So we did this thing like we were sitting in our studio drinking tea when the phone rang, (laughs) that type of thing. (laughs) And we talked about scanning the waterfronts and so on and so forth, submitted the article, thought that the editor is going to be furious. And she called us the next day laughing and said, I absolutely love it. We've never had anything like this. We're running it. And that was my very first publication. And I walked into the market and saw the magazine on the magazine rack and quickly flipped to our story. And I go, wow, I'm a writer. Yeah, it does make you feel good when you see your work out on the mainstream rack or bookshelf or whatever. Absolutely. So now 600 articles later, working on my 20th book, Wow. And I've been a writer for 20 years now. Wow, that's incredible. And we're lucky to have you as part of our 1 million books in 100 days campaigns, our program, our family is what we call it. <laughs> exactly. We really do appreciate that. Yes, I do that, feel like so. a family member. Yeah. Good, you should. <laughs> you get to bring the jello to the potluck. But anyway, <laughs> so why don't you tell us about the books that you have with 1 million books in 100 days where they can go out and get them on okay. our website. Okay, well, of course, all of my books are on Amazon and on most of the online bookstores. And when you search my name, sometimes you have to put quotes around it because there's also a resort, Morgan St. James or St. James, something like that. Sure. But let's start from the beginning over here. And the first book is Writer's Tricks of the Trade. And as I said, I wrote over 600 articles about the business and techniques of writing. Mm -hmm. And people kept asking me when I did workshops, do you have a book? And I didn't have a book. I said, go on to my website go here, go there. So I finally took the 39 most interesting and helpful articles and put them into book form. Interesting. Yeah, Yeah. and it's written in easy prose. It's not a techie kind of thing. It doesn't go really in depth, but it's very inspirational, has some different little exercises to do. But it not only talks about the successes, it talks about what can backfire, Mm -hmm. And at the back of the book is a bibliography of books I consider reliable that are in-depth on different subjects that people can refer to if they want to know more about a subject. Okay, Okay. Okay. that's very helpful. And the next book is Scammed, and that's part of the Revenge is Fun series, (laughs) which now has five books in it. And I have to say, many of my fiction books include things that were inspired by real events. Interesting. Scammed. I killed off a guy, and I didn't have to go to jail for it. There you go. But but the problem was he'd already died by the time I wrote the book. Oh, really? So I didn't get the revenge (laughs) I wanted. Yeah. But he was an HOA president that caused me a great deal of grief and $40,000. Oh, Oh, man. I waited for years to have the right story to kill him. Right. And like I said, unfortunately, he had already died, so I couldn't send him a copy of it. Yeah, A Corpse in the Soup is the first book in the Silver Sisters Mysteries, Mm -hmm. and I co-author that series with my sister, who is also a fine artist. Oh, nice. And there was a write-up on us in the RJ when we first came out with that book. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, the book brought us together as sisters. We didn't know each other very well at all because she moved to Alaska when she was 20. Oh, nice. 
nice. And my oh. mom was always the conduit between mm-hmm. us. But then when my mom got sick, we started communicating with each other, found out how many things we liked, and among them were funny mysteries. Oh, that's so great. that was the birth of Corpse in the Soup. We're working on the sixth book in the series now. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah. Okay. And then Bumping Off Fat Vinny. I love that <laughs> okay. title. Yes. The title yes. alone, I'm there. And it was inspired by a publisher who did Denny Griffin and I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And it's part of the Revenge is Fun series. Oh, good. Yeah. And all of these, while there is either a a murder or a big crime or whatever, the humor is there. Yeah. And the humor is in the Silver Sisters mysteries, too. Good. And then the fifth book up there is Terror in a Teapot, Mm -hmm. which is the second book in the Silver Sisters mysteries. And if you like to know about places you've not been or don't live, a lot of it takes place in Juneau, Alaska and in Seattle. Oh, cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. My sister lived in Juneau for over 30 years. So the things that are in there aren't off of stuff on the net. It's off of authentic people she knew. And so that's it. Wow. Awesome. (laughs) And we are so glad we have all five of these. And maybe as we grow, we can add more in the future. So you're working on another one, too. Yes. Yes. We're working on the Six Silver Sisters book, which is Hit Job in Hollywood. That's great. Oh, wow. Your titles are the best. I mean, I'm intrigued. I've read a couple of them, but the Vinny one is the one that I want to do now. So, yeah. Oh, Fat Vinny is the <laughs> character you love to hate. Oh, good. Oh, good. He's love really obnoxious. Like and he's a composite of several people that Denny and I have known. And I have to say that part of the plot in trying to kill Vinny is that we were given a lot of advice by the late Frank Collada, who was oh, Frank second, in, yeah, yeah. second in command to Tony Spencer. Bellatro in right. the mob. He was the guy. Yeah. yeah, Frank was a good guy in the end. <laughs> in the end. In the end. In the end. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Okay, so now that's on my summer reading list. <laughs> exactly. I can't do anything else all summer because I want to read all these books. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you've just said 20 books and all the works and all of that. And uh, of course, you've been involved with our campaigns for quite a while. But what really drew you to One Million Book? What was the thing? I mean, I know we're showing. <laughs> Facing indie authors and all that kind of thing, but was there one particular aspect of this campaign that really drew you to it? Yeah, actually two. Okay. The first one was people are not spending enough time reading books. They're on the web, they're letting TV do their thinking for them, and books trigger the creativity in a person yep. be- and the imagination because the characters in a book are whoever you want them to be in your concept. And I thought that the aspect of having autographed books available Mm -hmm. was Mm -hmm. really a wonderful way to induce people to say, hey, maybe this is the time I'll buy a book and this one really appeals to me or I really like sci-fi or I like fantasy because you have so many genres Mm -hmm. on the site. And the second thing was the contribution to charity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so between the two, the only choice that I had to make was which books to give you. Right. Yeah. And in every campaign, then you do get to add more books, which is awesome. And on top of that, not just as a single author that's joined us, but you have a few genres. So you've really helped us expand that because that's really important for everyone. Just like you said. Right. We want everybody to understand that you go here and if you want a children's story, a sci-fi, a murder mystery, whatever you want, we got it. Right. It's well done and it's for a good cause, double good cause, getting yeah. books in people's hands yes. and getting some money to charity. Yeah, yeah, and that is specific to 1 million books in 100 days. We do not do any ebooks or audiobooks. It's just the actual physical book because that's important to all of the authors that are involved. So that's a good point to bring up. Right. Well, as much as the ebooks and audiobooks are popular, and I have both, all my well, books sure. are on we e-books. all do. Yeah. yeah. Six of my books are in audio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's something about turning those pages and feeling that book in your hands. Nothing exactly. like it. Exactly. Nothing like it. For sure. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today on Aspects of Writing so we could talk with you about One Million Books in 100 okay. Days. We're going to direct everybody to go out to One Million Books in 100 Days.com. Mm-hmm. And you can look up Morgan St. <laughs> James and find all of her delightful books out there. And I'd like to take a moment to thank the rest of the authors that joined mm-hmm. us during our show. 
show, Sarah Tosh, Joe Cortese, Susan Johnson, and of course, again, Morgan, we appreciate having you here. It was my pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. And as James Kelly always ends (laughs) his show and always says, if you can dream it, you can write it. And please join us next time when we have more of these delightful authors with us. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing. We hope you will join us next week as we discuss every aspect of the writing industry. Until then, if you can dream it, you can write it.